Chapter Ten of the Master Mystery. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Master Mystery by John W. Gray and Arthur B. Reeve. Chapter Ten. As Eva hurried down the dock, looking for the renegade Flint, she found herself cornered between the emissary and the terrible automaton himself. With a scream of terror she ran until she came to a door that divided the dock into fireproof sections. Through it she darted, the automaton following relentlessly. Meanwhile Locke, his lungs almost bursting and the blood surging to his head, had managed to free himself from his shackles and had floated to the surface of the water. As he came up, he swam to the piles of the dock just as several boatmen saw him and hurried to his aid. They heard the screams of Eva, and all started running up the dock, but not in time to capture the automaton, who, warned by the emissaries, crashed through the side of the dockhouse nearest the shore and escaped. A moment later Locke, searching through the piles of boxes, bales, and crates, found Eva just recovering from her fright, and in the joy of having saved her by his timely return, forgot, for the moment, to pursue the terrible villain, who managed to reach a waiting closed car and was whisked away. Thus it was that after their return to Brent Rock, on the following day, Eva was ministering to her father, still hopelessly insane through the failure to discover the antidote to the madness. While Eva was engaged in her ministrations upstairs, Locke was finishing some experiment in his laboratory. Downstairs, Balcom had just arrived in the hall, where he was met by Zita with a report of what had happened the day before. "'Tell it to me in the strong room while I place this package there,' Balcom whispered, indicating the package which he had brought. Together, Balcom and Zita descended to the cellar and made their way to the graveyard of genius as Zita poured forth her story, unmindful of the fact that the butler had seen them go down and was watching very skeptically. In the graveyard, Balcom unwrapped a small model of a motor and placed it on the shelf. Eva, having left her father, came upon Locke in the hall, and there they stood, talking for a moment, while the butler approached apologetically. "'Begging your pardon, Miss Brent,' he reported, "'but I just saw Mr. Balcom go down to the strong room with Miss Zita, and I thought you might like to know.' "'Thank you,' nodded Eva, dismissing the butler and trying to show no concern in the matter. But Locke shot a quick glance at her as the servant left, and it was evident that both felt the same suspicion, for Locke immediately excused himself and hurried downstairs. In the graveyard, Balcom and Zita were talking in subdued tones, as Zita whispered, "'I suppose you know,' she nodded, "'that before Mr. Brent went mad, he wrote a confession with a list of these inventions which International Patents has suppressed?' Balcom could scarcely conceal his rage. "'Yes, I know it,' he replied savagely. "'That confession would cause a great deal of trouble.' Low as they were talking, they would have been even more careful had they known that Locke was listening outside, and that even as they turned to leave the strong room, he had sidled out of the way and was rejoining Eva in the library. Locke had scarcely told Eva what he had heard when she moved over to the safe and would have tried to open it had he not stopped her. For he had heard the other two coming from the cellar, and even as it was, they were at the hall door. "'My dear,' remarked Balcom as he entered and went to Eva, "'since your father is not likely to recover, I must ask you to transfer all the company papers from his private safe to the office of the company.' Eva did not respond to the fatherly manner assumed by Balcom. Instead, she almost point-blank refused to do as he had requested. Just then, Locke, whom Balcom had almost ignored up to the present, heard the noise of someone coming through the conservatory. It was Paul Balcom, 
his coat on his arm, his sleeves rolled up, and a tennis racket in his hand, as he had come just from the courts. Paul glanced surlily at Locke, who bowed pleasantly to him, as well he might, considering their relative positions in Eva's real affections. Catching sight of his father with Eva, Paul paused a moment. It was just at that instant that Balcom had been saying to her, "'Why don't you marry Paul, as you promised your father and me? That would settle all the difficulties.' Paul had suspected the nature of the conversation, though he approached as if ignorant of it. Apparently catching the drift, he deftly urged her, but Eva tactfully changed the subject, greatly to Paul's chagrin and his father's ill-suppressed anger. The suspense of the situation was relieved for Eva by the nearer approach of Locke, who must have had some inkling of what was going on. Paul and his father exchanged glances as the young chemist and detective joined Eva, and it was evident that no love toward him was wasted by either. "'Excuse me,' she apologized, walking away with Locke, "'but there is something very important that I must attend to for my father's interests.' Locke and Eva walked to the safe, while Balcom and Paul watched like hawks. A moment later, Eva was kneeling before the safe, after giving Locke a paper which contained the combination numbers to open the bolts. Locke glanced at it, then held it where Eva could read, Combination of safe. Turn once left to forty. Three right to eighteen. Once left to forty. As Locke held the paper and Eva's slender hand spun the combination lock, Balcom and Paul moved silently forward. Although Locke was holding the paper with the combinations for Eva, he heard them come up behind him and knew that they were watching. With a quiet smile to himself, he moved the paper over so that they could see it, nor were they slow to take advantage of the chance. Locke's mind was working fast, and he had a purpose in what seemed to be carelessness or even foolishness. A moment later, Eva opened the safe, and from it she took a typewritten document of many pages. It read, Board of Directors, International Patents, Inc., New York. Gentlemen, in view of the government's antitrust investigation, I have prepared this list of inventions we have suppressed. I think we should discuss at our annual meeting the advisability of surrendering our rights to these inventions, no matter what may happen to the corporations we have been protecting. Very truly yours, Peter Brent. Following this letter was a bulky paper, or rather set of papers, which detailed the inventions and their history, exposing some of the nefarious operations of the corporation. Balcom, as he read the top letter, showed great agitation. As Locke took the package from Eva, Balcom interrupted. "'That's very dangerous,' he said. "'If it gets out, the corporations are ruined.' Locke scarcely replied. Instead, he very ostentatiously replaced the document in the safe, refusing to entrust it either to Balcom or to Paul, who withdrew sullenly, leaving Eva alone with Locke in the library as Locke whirled the combination of the closed safe door. It was perhaps half an hour later in the secret den of the automaton in the rock-hewn foundation of Brent Rock that the emissaries were watching the arched and dark passage. Suddenly there was the warning clank, and the huge steel monster strode in. For some time he stood before the table, giving his instructions by means of mysterious, cryptic motions. Meantime, above in Brent Rock, Locke had been busy, for he had conceived an entirely new plan to capture the automaton. It was nothing short of an electric trap, and deadly in its simplicity. From the wall switch Locke had led wires carrying the house current. 
Already, also, he had let Eva in on his secret plan, and she was all eagerness as he planted his trap. Before the safe now, Locke paused, and there for a moment twisted the combination so that he could get his correct position. That done, he noted the place where he had been standing and removed a mat from the floor in front of the safe. At that place he set in on the floor a fairly large iron plate. To this iron plate he attached a wire, then replaced the rug, but in such a way that a part of the plate was exposed, though it would never be noticed. "'If the automaton attempts to open the safe,' he remarked to Eva as he worked, "'he will complete the electric circuit, and it will hold him until we capture him.' "'How clever!' Eva exclaimed involuntarily. "'Now for making my signaling connection to the laboratory,' continued Locke. "'Then I must get some of my men up here from the department.' However, while Locke and Eva were busy arranging this electric trap, they did not notice that they were being watched by Zita, who had stolen into the conservatory and was eyeing them eagerly from the protection of the fronds of the palm. Zita, moreover, was greatly excited, as she gathered with her quick perception just what it was that they were doing. Nor did she wait to see the work finished, but stole out of the door and away, hurriedly. Locke had finished his preparations, and as he and Eva were discussing the possibilities of which he had devised, he remarked, in answer to her eager inquiry about his suspicions, I am sure we shall prove that there is a man inside that terrible machine that attacks us. "'Then you don't think it is really an automaton?' asked Eva, with great respect for Locke's opinion, though it was sufficiently in evidence that she was not at all convinced that the monster was not really of steel and controlled by something that resembled a human brain. Locke was noncommittal. "'This trap will tell us.' was all he would say. Zita, hurrying out from the conservatory, and wishing to waste not an instant in notifying Balcom, sought a nearby telephone pay station, and there, in frantic haste, she demanded Balcom's number. It was some moments before Central could make the connection, and then it was only to Zita's disappointment and growing fear. The Madagascan servant of Balcom answered in the absence of his master. "'Is Mr. Balcom there?' asked Zita, adding. "'Or Mr. Paul?' The black shook his head. "'Neither Mr. Balcom nor Mr. Paul is at home,' he replied. Zita was now thoroughly alarmed. Had she some connection with the automaton? Or was it her fear that either Balcom or Paul might know more than they would care to have the authorities know? Or was the automaton really an iron monster, after all? That and many other questions were surging through the minds of all who had encountered this unique mystery. End of chapter 10 Recording by Roger Moline